Good afternoon. As you know, I will talk in, in English because I prepared the whole work in English. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Annette van de Gorn and, and Music Research for such a kind invitation to give this talk. <clears throat> the paper I will read covers uh, several years, perhaps five years, research period devoted to understand how the different formats available for the concert, as well as for the distribution on the recording industry and for broadcasting influence on the way we think on space in the acousmatic musical discourse, and we'll introduce some strategies about how to manage these different formats to preserve our, our idea of space when moving from one to another. Since the beginning of times, we are able to find the relation between technological advances and aesthetic evolution. The sound of the instrument of each period has to do with the music composed on that period. On our field, the quality of the recorded sound has become independent from the traditional acoustic concept related to the perception of sound in a concert hall. More in this sense, during the last 60 years, the recorded sound developed a very noticeable paradigmatic quality, similar as the evolution of instruments has had before. For the acousmatic composers, this is a central concern. Their work has to perform both as poor music as well as recorded music. As has happened throughout the history of music with the evolution of musical instruments, the evolution of the support on which the sound discourse resides has played a prominent role in the evolution of the musical style itself, and this has been particularly noticeable in acousmatic music. The development of the recording industry has been decisive in the evolution of the characteristics of the support. So, according to these ideas, the acousmatic music composer is facing a double or perhaps, or perhaps multiple paradigmatic situation. On one side, he has to define the final concert format. On the other side, he is supposed to create a sufficient, convincing, and technically perfect version for distribution on CD, also useful for broadcasting and streaming, and in recent years, probably also in a valid surround format like 5.1. As said, a new format becomes paradigmatic when the composers consider it as a reference for their finished work. On the 70s, the most relevant space projection tools, which were the Paris Jerems Acousmonium and the Gmebaphon, later Cybernephon by the Bourges Imeb group, were thought as performatic expansion tools, starting from stereo composition already completed by their composers. As time went by, this situation evolved and those tools and their institutions, as well as some later but not less le relevant ones, like this one, for instance, the Influx Acousmonium of Musique Recherche, began to allow sound projection from both stereo or multi-channel originals. As from the middle of the following decade, on one side we know that on the 80s and 90s there were already some composers thinking directly in eight channels, or even in a multiple of eight, as for example 16 or 32. Uh, and uh, that on the last decade of the 20th century, an industry standard as it was the 8th channel ADAT could be found at the main electroacoustic research centers, and in the 90s some composers began to include it at their personal studios. We may compare this way of thinking the musical discourse directly in multiple loudspeakers to 19th and 20th century composers who worked directly for orchestra. This way of thinking consider the main concepts introduced by Pierre Schaeffer and confirmed on, uh, or extended by Dennis Smalley when he talks about gesture, texture, energy, and trajectory. If we think our discourse in this way, then we feel the need to compose directly on multiple channels. On the other side, having so many places with eight or a multiple of eight channel systems ready for concerts, many of us perceived these as small acousmoniums suitable for eight or, for instance, 16 channel projection starting from stereo originals. And in some cases, we could see, and even now, we may see this practice in lots of events. <clears throat> 
but some composers perceived this as a challenge and decided to revise their stereo pieces, getting alternative versions for the eight channel diffusion standards. In this point, I consider eight or any multiple of eight as corresponding to the same eight channel basic idea or paradigmatic unity. My examples and graphics won't be related to 8, but may be extended to 16, 24, 32, and so on. This challenge opened the door to our imagination, offering us the possibility of working with great detail on the texture of the sound, and even create new textures from the existing ones, as it happens with the orchestration of piano works in the instrumental music. We'll analyze some strategies on this field in a moment. At this point, we may ask ourselves, which is the final version of a piece? The multiphonic concert one? Or the stereo CD version for distribution and broadcasting? Perhaps both? The evolution of the recording industry has no relation with art. We may affirm this, as we did not get from the industry an octophonic format for massive distribution. On the contrary, years later, when the industry decided to offer a multiphonic alternative, they prefer the cinema industry surrounding 5.1 channels as a new format, which of course impacted on acousmatic music composition. When the composers make their choice for octophony, the eight-channel placement becomes a part of the composition. These are some of the most usual octophonic loudspeaker placements. On the, on the graphics, we may see uh, first, the distribution by pairs of channels, then the distribution in circle, cross channels, pairs with central, front, rear. Of course, there may be more, but these are the most usual. Composers make work on this or any other placement for the loudspeakers. There are software tools that allow to emulate any possible loudspeaker disposition without the need to move them during the concert. Developed in the 70s by Michael Gerson and Peter Felget at the Oxford and Reading Universities in the, UN, in the UK, with the support of the British National Research Development Corporation, ambisonics is one of the most convenient and imaginative techniques developed around the idea of projecting the sound on space. It records a 360-degree sound field using a single-point microphone with four or eight capsules. The sound field is processed with their own proprietary UHJ encoding, which is compatible with mono and stereo audio. Ambisonics was originally thought as hardware plus software. And in that case, it needs, of course, a dedicated equipment, which is very expensive. There are some wonderful software implementations of Ambisonics that allow us to emulate any possible loudspeaker disposition, starting from a minimum of four, without the need to move the existing loudspeakers during the concert. I will just mention three of these alternatives. The Ambisonics Toolkit, designed for the Reaper Multitrack Digital Audio Workstation and for the Super Collider Programming Language, developed with the support of the Center for Digital Arts and Experimental uh, Media at the University of Washington and by the Bergen Center of Electronic Arts in Norway. The Ambilip Tools for Poor Data, developed at the Cornell University Electroacoustic Music Center in the USA, and the ICST Tools for Max, developed by the Institute for Computer Music and Sound Technology at the University of the Arts in Switzerland. About the strategies for the octophonic expansion starting from stereo, instead of leaving these issues in the domain of a software tool, no matter how perfect it may be, I personally prefer to consider it as an accessory and introduce some more handmade criteria for sound manipulation. On a paper I presented at the Sonic Arts Network conference in 2004 in Leicester, I introduced some qualities of the acousmatic discourse as well as some questions referred to the difference in sound reception from the public compared to its perception by the participants of an interactive performance. Those considerations about the audience's perception are applicable to the case of expansion from an, origi an, an original acousmatic stereo piece into a multi-channel sound setting. 
To talk about gestuality, we need, we need to mention first the Gestalt theory. According to the Gestalt, we naturally perceive the whole more than the sum of its parts. Starting from this idea, in an acousmatic discourse, we can recognize different gestural saliences or recognizable elements that we perceive in accordance with our focal aptitude to comprehend the texture of that discourse. The perception of these gestural saliences will depend on the distribution of the sound energy along the, the timeline, as well as on its position and spatial displacement. More about this, Dennis Smalley, on his well-known Spectromorphology and Structuring Processes article, writes about the level and focus perception and introduces the idea of focal depth as a textual concept when he says that we feel the need to change our perspective focus happening for diverse levels during the process of listening. And that gesture has to see what trajectory, with the application of energy and its join to the causality. According to Smalley, the perception of sound gesture is tied with the perception of its texture, and this is central to the comprehension of the whole discourse. Starting from these ideas, on a paper presented at the Electroacoustic Music Studies Conference, EAMS, in 2009, I introduced the idea of gestural manipulation as a possible strategy when doing the transcription of a given texture originally conceived for a certain spatial distribution in order to maintain its essence into another different distribution. In other words, we may consider the gesture of the sound discourse as ruled by its gestural saliences, and departing from there, we may emphasize them, altering their relations of intensity, and thus giving them the ability to impact on our perception in a different way, as they should at their original placement, and with their initial energy distribution. By doing this, we'll be able to obtain a more vivid sound image than the one embedded in the stereospatial allocation. We may call this procedure gestural emphatization or emphasizing. To do this, we may just clone the stereo original, for instance, to four stereo pairs to get eight. And by editing dynamics, we can remark different saliences on each of these clones, remarking what in fact is already there with an innovative spatial distribution. Going a step forward, going a step forward, a, a different and very effective strategy is to create saliences not present in the original, and we may call this strategy as gestural elaboration. This can be very resourceful since these new saliences may be placed in some loudspeakers while not in others. Thus, we can impact the listener with a, much, a very much uh, complex texture than the original. It is not a question of contradicting the original idea, but of making use of the multiplicity of channels to obtain a major textural richness. Always working on these clones for the original stereo piece, we may also do a stereo image intervention, editing the trajectories and altering in some way the channel's energy distribution, applying different criteria for each of the stereo file clones. We may appreciate this on the following examples. All the examples are in stereo. I, I didn't bring with me examples in, in, in eight channels because I thought that we were not uh, having eight channels. So uh, you must um, use also your imagination a little. In any case, all the examples correspond to the piece that we will hear at the concert tonight. So if we stay here for the concert, you will uh, perceive these changes in texture. Um, so, let's see the gestural emphasizing alternative. We, first, we have the original stereo recording that comes from Cifra Oscura. Let's listen to it. <laughs> 
The second example includes dynamics emphasizing. Here we can see that there are about 12 accents added to the original. We may get, for instance, two different dynamics emphasized versions, or three different, or four, or more, depending on the number of channels. Um, we should distribute the accents into different clones in that case. Let's listen to the emphasized version. Now we edit trajectories inside each file to get another different version of this original. Again, we may distribute this intervention into more than one file to get multiple, slightly different versions. Of course, if we care about gesture and trajectories, in all these cases, we should think carefully where to place each one of the slightly modified copies of the original file. Here we have the gestural elaboration alternative. First, the origin is a different except for, from the same piece. Here we apply dynamics elaboration, which is a deeper intervention on the, on the texture. Um, you can see that we do not just accent, we also assign new gestures to the existing materials. Same as before, we may also get different dynamics elaborated versions by distributing these gestures in different versions. Again, we add the addition of trajectories inside each file to get another different version of the original. And we may also distribute this intervention into more than one file. Finally, we have here the gestural emphasizing plus gestural elaboration option. This is also a different except on the piece. Here, we, are also, we apply both techniques. We apply emphasizing plus elaboration. <laughs> 
here, of course, the, the third, the third uh, version in this screen, uh, same as before, uh, we include both dynamic plus trajectories edition and sounds like this. When we compose thinking in eight channels, if we want our piece to be distributed on CD or performed on media or streaming on the internet, then we need to think about an alternative version in stereo that should be also considered as a, as a valid version of, a version of the piece. More than that, our piece will be heard much more times on that stereo reduction than on the original concert octophonic version. In this case, we need to think more or less like if we were doing a piano transcription of an orchestral piece. All the original dynamic variations, no, all the original dynamic variations, no, no, maybe, no, it's 22 minutes. Yes, all the original dynamic variations should be kept at the perception of texture and should remain there. How we can achieve this goal? To maintain an acceptable dynamic range, we should work with as much as headroom as possible. This is the point where we should notice the benefits of working in multiple channels with as much sound quality as possible. For instance, if our 8-channel original is a 48K 24 bits, we will have as much as 144 dB of dynamic range. And this should allow us to use a very big headroom at the output mix bus without spoiling our original work. Let's say, for instance, 18 or 24 dB. After mixing and normalizing the output, there should not be any loss of dynamic range. If we do not use headroom when, doing, uh, when mixing to stereo, we will be forced to apply a limiter on the output bus, and the result will be an overcompressed stereo file far away from the original idea. About the surround option, we may remark the following four differences between any usual multi-channel setting for acousmatic music and Dolby Surround. First, Surround is a specific format thought for audio on the cinema. Second, Surround is not discrete. As per Dolby Labs papers, the Surround channels are considered as a whole. Third, the sound gesture and the use of trajectories is not the main use issue for Dolby Labs. Fourth, there are different channel categories in Surround. The front central channel is devoted to dialogues to keep the audience's eyes on the screen. The left surround and right surround as the effect channels, and the main difference between front and rear is dry versus wet, being reverb their main effect. These are motionless concepts compared to gesture, texture, projection, and trajectories, which are central to a cosmetic way of thinking the musical discourse. Dolby Labs developed what they call the surround matrix encoding and decoding. According to this matrix, uh, we can always get five channels out of two and vice versa. The matrix adds left plus right with a 3B reduction to obtain the front central and reduces another 3DB and passes it through two, two Dolby filters, a band pass and the well-known Dolby re noise, uh, noise reduction to get a mono surround channel. Finally, this surround channel is shifted 90 degrees forward and backward to create both rear channels called left surround and right surround, nothing to do with acousmatics. There are multiple audio formats in surround, including both lossless and lossy. Uh, on recent years, we saw the appearance of Blu-ray, which keeps the same logical format as DVD inside a different physical format with much more capacity. Uh, in some cases, in some cases, the DVD and Blu-ray players usually found on the market do not recognize lossless audio recording on DVDs and Blu-ray, so it makes no sense to work with this alternative in mind. 
the sweet point is a very important weakness of the eight channel format and but it is worse on the 5.1 alternative um, due to the limitations of space uh, so working in working in uh, 5.1 is a lesser option um, uh, compared with eight channel music in acousmatic music here we can see some of the usual eight channel layouts compared with the 5.1 standard disposition in the eight channels we have many different alternatives for spatial placement when the energy is distributed by pairs it's just like if it were thought for a number of four stereo pairs that resolve into eight when projected the cross-channel distribution also is a paired one but focusing on the spatial opposition of the sonic materials the circle layout may be clockwise or counterclockwise and of course may start in any of the eight loudspeakers. It is a typically non-paired disposition. Often the role of the channels change during the sound projection and paired distribution can change to a circle one. Instead of these, a 5.1 surround sound distribution is fixed and thus puts us into the problem of working with a much more static distribution and of course with less channels at the end it is a limitation nor like it no not like it was when we only were able to think in stereo but the limitation after all same as what happened with the transition from analog media to cd but perhaps in a much deeper sense any multi-channel environment makes possible to think in dynamic range as a relevant attribute as the number of loudspeakers is increased as far as we do not reduce the resolution in a, in a higher proportion, we may think on the use of wider dynamic contracts than stereo, considering that we handle a larger and more satisfactory signal-to-noise ratio. We may elaborate the sonic discourse using intensity as a variable, and this helps to get an improved textual perception of the sound discourse from the listener. So the real challenge should be not to lose the essential of a multi-channel composition on the new standards. And this is not an easy task when we feel tempted to migrate our ideas to the surround sound formats. About the plus and minus of the surround formats, we may affirm that the global acceptance of the surround formats for massive distribution is a plus. But on the other hand, we get the minus. The surround formats were originally thought for the cinema, not for music. Uh, so they used to define a, fi a fixed central front placement for dialogues and the rear channels for what Dolby Labs call sound effects. Uh, and as said, usually it corresponds to the reverb effect. The sound gesture is also not the main concept for Dolby. So in general, we can stay we can say that surround formats are originally less immersive than the usual multi-channel layouts we use in acousmatic music. The eight channels by pairs distribution is for sure a good starting point if we want to shrink from octophony to 5.1. A good strategy may be, as a first step, to shrink from eight to four channels. It may allow us, allow us to define the left and right frontal channels as well as the rear ones. We may begin by adding 1 plus 3 and 5 plus 7 on the left side and 2 plus 4 and 6 plus 8 on the right side. The amplitude level should be edited, keeping in mind that our goal is to preserve gesture and trajectories. We should consider that at any time we add two channels, we must reduce 6 dB to that mix to avoid saturation. Of course, we may always use ambisonics to emulate the original eight channels layout and reconstruct the original octophony out of a lesser number of channels. As we may see here, the second step is to create the central front channel and the point one sub low channel. We may follow the Dolby Lab surround matrix and add one plus two of the four channels, always reducing six dB or we may alternatively create an independent mix for C if we, if we think that there may be some elements on channels 3 and 4 that should be placed also on the front central or alternatively we may discard the central front channel and use the 5.1 scheme to get a 4.1 output, light quadrophony. Finally, we can mix channels 1 to 4 
in this case less 12 dB to avoid saturation, and low-pass filter the result to get the sublow 0.1 channel. Or eventually, also discard the sublow channel, which does not mean to lose it at all, as all DVD players can do the job for us. In that case, we'll obtain a 5.0 or 4.0 mix if we discarded the front ch central channel. And finally, finally, again, we may use ambisonics at the end of all this procedure to reconstruct the multi-channel space out of five or six loudspeakers and, of course, save these independent discrete output files for further use. Thank you very much. Thank you. Set you one.